So there I was, obviously I should quit. Uh, there was no sense in keeping, keeping going. And indeed, if I knew now, if I, if I knew then what I knew now, I absolutely would have quit. Because I've been fascinated with the idea of quitting uh, uh, over the last 15 or 20 years. And I finally did something about it in terms of research. Uh, I've always wanted to know whether, whether you should quit or not. And, uh, but how do you find that out? How do, you, how do you learn whether people should quit? Well, what you really need to do is you've got to find a bunch of people who are right on the edge. They just can't decide whether to, to like end a marriage or to quit a job or something like that. And then, uh, ideally, what you'd want to do is, is get them in a room and say, hey, OK, you don't know what to do. And, and for each one of them, flip a coin. Okay, if it came up heads, you'd say, okay, heads, okay, you divorce. Okay, tails, you've got to stay married even though you're not that happy and you think you might want to get divorced. Okay, so that's what you want to do. Obviously, very hard to do, but I took a shot at it. So I started a website called FreakonomicsExperiments.com, and it basically was exactly that. It said, if you're having a hard time making a decision, come to our website and we'll help you. So first, we would ask a bunch of questions, get people thinking differently about what they're doing. But ultimately, if they still couldn't decide, we did them a favor and we flipped a coin. Okay, and if it came up heads, we said, quit your job. If it came up tails, don't quit your job. Okay? And incredibly, uh, we got 25,000 people to come to this website, and we flipped coins for them on big decisions like the ones I'm talking about. And amazingly, uh, a lot of people followed our coin toss. So if you got heads, you are much more likely to quit your job than if you got tails. Okay? So it was a randomization. So then we followed them six months later, and we looked at the people who got heads, and we compared how happy they were to the people who got tails. So presume the only difference between the people who got heads and tails is that the ones who got heads quit their jobs more than the other ones. Okay? And it turned out that the people who got heads were substantially happier than the people who, uh, who got tails. And that was true over almost every single decision that we offered. Uh, getting divorced, breaking up, quitting your job, uh, um, quitting smoking, um, going on a diet. Basically, on everything, it turned out that the people who made a change uh, were happier than the people who didn't make a change. Okay, and so it's an actually interesting. So, so basically now, whenever anybody comes to me wringing their hands and saying, I don't know what to do, I just have an automatic response is, whatever is the most different from what you're doing now, if you can't decide, go do the thing that's most different from what you're doing now. Okay? Uh, so anyway, I didn't know that. I would have quit for sure. I mean, if I had known what I, what I know, I would have quit absolutely. But I didn't know that. And so uh, I wanted to persevere. I, you know, winners never quit. I, I, I fell prey to all of those, uh, those social constructions. And uh, so I went to my parents. And I confided in them. I told them how uh, I was uh, really in trouble and I didn't know what to do. And my father uh, actually gave me, uh, I think, the one and only inspirational speech he's ever given me in, in my life. Because I already told you about my father. He's more the, the cheat on the taxes kind of father than the <laughs> inspirational speech kind of father. Okay? And here's what he told me. I've got to give you a little bit of background so you can understand the story. So he's a medical researcher. And if you're a medical researcher, you go to med school, you do internship, you do residency, and then you got to go get a research fellowship. And that's a critical moment in your career is finding a mentor who can really, really build you into something special. And so my father, somehow back in the early 1960s, had managed to land a research fellowship at one of the most famous big Boston research hospitals. He was really uh, at the epicenter of research. His mentor was the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So he really was like in a super special spot. Okay? And everything was going great. His career couldn't have been going better when my father now tells me the story, he swears it's true, that about two months into his research fellowship, his mentor pulls my father into the office, sits him down, and he says, Levitt, I'm sorry to say, but you have no talent for medical research. Okay, you can imagine my dad's horror when he realizes that his mentor thinks he's terrible at research. But the guy goes on. He says, there is, however, one area of science which is so devoid of knowledge that even someone with your severe limitations might be able to make a contribution. Okay? And my dad says, well, well, what area is that? Okay, and I kid you not, the guy says to him, intestinal gas. Okay? Now, others might have reacted differently, but my dad took those words to heart. And he devoted his entire professional career to researching intestinal gas. Okay? He became the world's foremost medical expert on the topic. And okay, not only did, did he get all sorts of awards and accolades within his profession, he actually got to be a little bit of a, of a, of a, a kind of B-list celebrity. So for instance, when I was in high school, much to my amazement, GQ, you know, the men's magazine, did a two-page pictorial spread on my dad. And the headline read, the king of farts, they call my dad. Okay? So you got to remember, this is my dad's inspirational speech as he's, he's describing his career. So he says, look, 
I had no talent, you have no talent. <laughs> if you want to succeed in a profession for which you have no talent, the only hope you have is to take on a set of topics that are so embarrassing and degrading that nobody with any self-respect would go near those topics. And uh, I thought about it and I said, well, it worked for you, Dad, and I don't have a lot of other options, so maybe I'll give that a shot. And so I went back to MIT, and instead of trying to study the money supply and interest rates and the things that are important to economics, I started trying to, you know, uh, catch sumo wrestlers cheating by um, throwing matches and, and cheating school teachers and, and figuring out what, whether the name you give your kids matters for life outcomes. And uh, it's really, really amazing that uh, my dad's advice turned out to be the best advice I ever got, which is that if you have no talent, you got to be different. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the extension of that is even if you have talent, there's nothing like being different. I mean, you're in a very competitive business, right? You compete tooth and nail. Uh, thinking differently, one good idea, like one John Szilagyi like idea can change the path of a firm, uh, you know, of, of a life, of a career. And, uh, and I think none of us really actually uh, have the luxury of spending time trying to think and, and really go after ideas. And that's one of the great things about being a, a university professor like I am, is that my total obligation for teaching is about 60 hours a year, okay? And so other than that, I can do absolutely whatever I want. And I have spent uh, roughly, um, you know, roughly, I don't know, an hour a day just trying to think big, trying to come up with ideas. And uh, look, I'm not good at it. I spend an hour a day, and if I have one or two ideas that I call good in a year, it's a, it's a great year. It's successful. Okay, I, I'm sure many of you, all of you, if you spent 300 hours thinking about ideas, could come up with one or two, probably four or five really good ideas. Look, and I never, I was always unsure, was it really a good investment? You know, uh, 300 hours for one good idea. And uh, look, the thing is, though, we cobbled together one or two good ideas over the course of 10 years, and we turned it into a book. We called it Freakonomics, and we sold 6 million copies. And after that, I thought, yeah, that's a pretty good return on, uh, pretty good return on my investment.